Thank you so much for joining us today. We would love to hear how God is using this ministry in your life. So please, take a minute and send your story to stories at edgewaterchurch.com so that we can celebrate that with you. And if God has used this ministry to touch you in any way, then we want to encourage you. Partner with us financially. Help us to continue to deliver God's word to the world. Just go to edgewaterchurch.com and click the Give button. Again, thanks for joining us and enjoy today's message. I'm a passionate follower of Jesus Christ. I have the honor of being your Celebrate Recovery Pastor here on Monday night at 7 o'clock. I'm known to tell bad jokes, and my name's Rob. Do me a favor, community, and just share me with your name on three. One, two, three. Good morning. Good morning to you all. That introduction is kind of what I want to cover. You heard, I heard it uh, three times already this morning. People first and foremost identifying themselves as passionate follower of Jesus Christ, which I think is just amazing because that's what, that's what this message is going to be about. Who am I? Who am I? You know, uh, sometimes even when God puts something in front of me to show me that he wants me to take this next step like this, and I go, who am I? Who am I to use this? But see, God loved us so much that he didn't want just my, my, what I'm afraid of or what the world wants to label me or what I even label myself. He doesn't want that to be the first uh, position. My first position as I introduced myself was I'm a passionate follower of Jesus Christ. Then what together we are working on and then my name. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning here. Now, some of you might be thinking, Celebrate Recovery Pastor is probably going to be talking about Celebrate Recovery again. Of course I am. Yeah. Absolutely I am. You think I would just keep quiet on this thing? That with God, the grace that he's given this guy here about it? Absolutely not. I'm going to talk about it till the last breath that I have here on earth. Amen? Yeah. Now, some of you that might have just checked out, stay with me. Because listen, this isn't just... This grace, this, this teaching that I have learned, this beatitudes that we're going to talk about, isn't for just those people. Okay, This is for all of us. That's right. Jesus has a teaching that he wants each and every one of us to know. And that's what I'm going to cover this morning. And it's, it's a sermon, one of his famous sermons of all, was the Sermon on the Mount. And that's what I'm going to be sharing with you this morning here. And that's the foundation of where, where we get... Our, uh, our foundation for our, not only our recovery, but as Christians as well. This is, this is what Jesus wanted us to build our foundation on. So if you have your Bibles, get them out uh, or the app, but I'm going to be doing it in the uh, message version for you this morning because when I was doing this and I came across this, I really loved how these words were put together for this. So Matthew chapter 5 is where we'll be. Here we go. It says, when Jesus saw his ministry drawing huge crowds, he climbed a hillside. Those who were apprenticed to him, the committed, climbed with him. Arriving at a quiet place, he sat down and taught his climbing companions. And this is what he said. You are blessed when you are at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and his rule. You are blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then... Can you be embraced by the one most dear to you? You are blessed when you're content with just who you are. No more, no less. That's the moment you find yourself proud owners of everything that can't be bought. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God, his food and drink. You're blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful, you find yourselves cared for. You're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind, and your heart right. Then 
You can see God in the outside world. You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. You're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. The persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. This is an incredible teaching from God of how he can use our brokenness, what we bring to him, what the world meant for evil, and turn it into good, to be used to help bring people into his kingdom. When I, when I first began to come to Edgewater, before I came to Edgewater, all I had was brokenness. That's all I had. I had, my identity was someone who caused so much pain in my personal life and in my marriage through my actions that my marriage at that time was dead. I describe it as dead, dead, four days, Lazarus body stinketh dead. Wow. That's dead. That's what I had. Before I came into church or a relationship with Jesus Christ, all I had was someone uh, who was worried all the time. I was worried about people. I was worried about places. I was worried about things that were completely out of my control. I was somebody who just wanted peace of mind. I was also somebody who constantly worried about money. As a provider, would I be able to provide enough? And then sometimes there were seasons when there was more than enough, and I would worry, how am I going to keep this up? Constantly worried about money. I felt inadequate, not capable of handling certain situations. I felt less than. I kept having these self-doubts. Anyone else? Oh yeah. We're in good company. Because there's this guy called Paul. Now, Apostle Paul, for those that are just beginning to come to church here, let me just give you the on top of my head version of this, okay? Paul, before he was Paul, his name was Saul. And this guy was a bad dude. This guy didn't want this Christian movement, didn't want this good news spread about Jesus Christ to happen at all. He persecuted them. He went around and took it per personally and actually even killed Christians. And he was still well on his way and continuing to do this because he believed that his religion, that his law was the only way. Scared him to death. Until one day, he came face to face with Jesus himself. And Jesus asked him, why are you persecuting me? After that day, after that time of that encounterment with Jesus, his name no longer was Saul, but became Paul. And Paul was one of the greatest deliverers of the good news of all. Wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. So, we're in his company. Because as you're going to see here in uh, in just a minute, that he wrote why he was having so much trouble. In Romans 7, 14, he writes this. So the trouble is not the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. <clears throat> I, really, I really don't understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. How many times have we had that conversation with ourselves saying, I will never do that again. Or, I will never give that person my peace of mind. Or, I will never react to this situation that way again. Just this past couple of weeks, same thing was happening to me again where I was overnight through the night is where a lot of these thoughts usually come to me. And it was about a work situation. And I kept thinking, how am I 
going to resolve this? How am I going to make fix this? How am I? And all I could come up with is, I'm not capable. I'm going to fall short. So, there is that. Is that it? Is is that the end? Is it just because that's the way we are? It's just me, the way that my sin is? No. See, we've been doing this blame game for a long time. Where it's like, it's not my fault. It's just the way I am. Or, God, it's just the way that you allowed me to be. See, this goes back all the way from the very beginning from Adam and Eve. Where Adam stood there and said, hey God, it's the woman that you gave me who gave me the fruit, right? Side note, I would love to see Eve's face when Adam pulled that stunt, by the way. <laughs> man, I would love to see her face on that. I'll bet you that cave was a cold cave that night, man. Get over there. Take your fig leaf with you. <laughs> I'm surprised there's human race after that. Okay. But we, <laughs> well, we do it all the time. We do the same thing all the time. If, if, if I could just take the kids in this car without it being a circus, I wouldn't have to act like a madman screaming, don't make me turn this car around, swinging wildly, hoping to connect to one of them. <laughs> and if you're in a minivan, you got to get creative and find something and toss something back there at them because they know better. They're way in the back. Not my fault. They would just behave like if my boss or coworker wasn't such a jerk, I wouldn't have to spread rumors about them so I could feel <laughs> superior. It's their fault. If I made more money, ah, if I just make more money, I'd be more generous. Maybe I'd even try this tithe thing. No, I'm not laughing at her, is it? <laughs> I know, I'm meddling. If my husband would just read my mind, All right. If my husband would just read my mind and act like what I see in the movies, those Hallmark movies, pick me up, sweep me up in that horse-drawn carriage and take me to the grocery store. I wouldn't have to yell at him to cut the grass or take out the dang trash. <laughs> If my wife would just realize that I love her without having to show her all the time, giving her gifts or saying it every day, she should know that I love her, right? Maybe the grass wouldn't look so green on the other side then because I wasn't watering it on this side. Blame game. But thank God there's an escape clause. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Romans 7, 20, 25 says, Paul says, thank God the answer is Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You see how it is? In my mind, I really want to obey God's law. But because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. Really? Is it that simple? that it? The answer is simple. But the faith takes action. The faith takes action. I had, for me, I had to admit that I was powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and that my life had become unmanageable. So who am I? Well, my first name is I'm not God. Remember the first beatitude. You are blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there's more of God and his rule. I remember the time when I was at my lowest point in my life. Completely felt alone. And I remember this conversation, and it, it wasn't a verbal, I didn't hear his I didn't hear him speak. I just remembered that there was this conversation that I was having. I thought it was God. 
And I remember him saying to me, you have a choice to make right about now. He said, you can choose to continue to do your will this way and keep getting what you've been getting if you want. Or you can choose mine, my will. And at the time, I didn't even know what that will looked like. I didn't know what his will looked like. I didn't know it was going to look like this or what I'm doing for Celebrate Recovery or anything. I did, all I knew, I didn't know his will, but I knew mine. I knew mine. And I didn't like mine. That's when I was able to say, I choose your will. And by doing that, from that point, and being able to be used by him, and be able to, be, to grow into this relationship with him, that, as I mentioned before, remember my marriage dead, 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 to today my marriage is alive and thriving today because of him. We're so in love that we, we get blocked sometimes on Facebook because of all our ooey gooey pictures that we put on there. Go Kelly! <laughs> yes, go Kelly. You know why, but you know why, you know why we, we do that? Honestly, I want to, I want to share something with you. It, it isn't because of the, to get likes. It really isn't. It's because we think that it, um, it's an amazing platform to use uh, in this world to be able to show how much you love your spouse and how good marriage is these days. Amen. That's why we do it. If we can post pictures of what we ate last night or cute pictures of cats in costumes, I should be able to do that. Yes? And I will. Or dogs in cute costumes, too. I don't want to. There you go. <laughs> but this is a process. From where, from where I was talking about there to today where I'm talking about, this is a process. There, this isn't a drive-through breakthrough. This isn't just going, one please, and off we go. It takes time. But know this, that there are many things that we can celebrate that God has given us victory over. The day will come, the day will come for each and every one of us to find out why we've been given this grace. Why have we been given this grace? I believe one of the answers is what Jesus shared with his disciples in Matthew 4, 18, where he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me. He took my history and made it his story for him. That's why I believe that he has given me this grace. Okay. It's intentional. In Matthew 5.13, it also talks about us being the salt and the light. I'm going to continue with the message version of this. I believe this is also why we have been given this amazing grace by God. It is, let me tell you why you are here, he says. You're here to be the salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Church, say shine. shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to elders, you'll prompt people to open up with God. This generous Father in heaven. It's impossible to be both what I labeled myself or what the world tries to label me and be the salt at the same time or be used as the light. It's one or the other that I, that I am. 
God doesn't know how to share and take second place in our lives. We can allow that. But God only knows one way. Him first. Him first. There's a poem that I want to share with you this morning, uh, written by Hosanna Poetry, that describes sometimes how the labels get put on us and how we, in turn, carry them, thinking that this is just the way that we are but puts it in a perspective to tell you how you can replace those labels and put the label that God has created you to be. She writes this, God spends a lot of time in the Bible telling us who we are. It's almost as if he knew we would doubt who that was from time to time. It's as if he saw it coming that we would spend our whole lives searching for what our identity, what our real name was, and that there'd be many moments in our lives that we would let different kinds of names to find us. When we first looked in the mirror, compared ourselves pictures of others, and heard the name ugly. When we've been left by loved ones, people we trusted once, and heard the name unworthy. When we've been drowning in discouragement, living in a seemingly never-ending crisis and heard the name forgotten. When we've had our hopes up and our hearts open only to be brought down by closed doors and we heard the word rejected. When we go to other vices to ease our pain and we hear the word addict. When we here for get forever broken, and we feel like we're living in a shadow of someone else's calling, and we hear second place. When our pain cripples us to a point where we don't even know how to let others in, and we hear the word lonely. When my past seems too gross for others to forgive, and we hear disgusting, it's overwhelming these voices we're constantly hearing. It's suffocating this air, a, const a constant critique and comparing. And it's sort of amazing the people whose voices I've allowed to name me, the power of giving to my past, to my mirror, and to my surroundings, and enabled them to identify me the amount of years I spent living up to what others say over me. But God says something else about me. It's like he knew there'd be other voices. So he wrote his voice down in a timeless book of truth that would remind us over and over again in the moments when lies would block his truths and somehow make us forget. I'm going back to the source. Not the people I've allowed to represent God to me, but the actual, literal, tangible words that he has written down for me, and there's something, some other names he has given me. John 15, 15, he calls me friend. 1 Thessalonians 1, 4, he calls me chosen. Yep. Ephesians 2, 10, he calls me his workmanship. He calls me art. He calls me handmade. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, he calls my body a temple. He calls me the residence of a Holy Spirit. Act 1, 8, he calls me his messenger to the world. Galatians 3, 26, he calls me his child. Romans 5, 8, he calls me greatly loved. John 8, 36, he calls me free, free indeed. It's amazing how different these names are from the names I'm used to listening to. And in my journey to discover who I really am and in my battle to uncover the truth of myself, I've learned something new about my name. And now this is what I am certain of. Who am I? I know that my name is not the name the world calls me. My name is not the past calls me. My name is not even the name my own mirror calls me. 
but my name is the name I answer to. That's my name. And I can choose today, from this moment forward, to answer to a new name. When I hear lonely, that's not me. When I hear disgusting, that's not me. When I hear unworthy, I don't even look over my shoulder. And when I hear broken, they must have me confused. Please, look somewhere else. Maybe those were my old names. But they're no longer the names that I respond to. These are the names that I respond to. Free. I'm worthy. Chosen. Forgiven. Masterpiece. Child of God. Greatly loved. What's your name? What is stirring inside of you? What did you come in with your, what you were carrying and what you said who you were and God is pressing on to you and saying who you really are, who you really are. Me? My name is I'm free. My name is I'm forgiven. At the beginning, when I introduced myself and I told you my name and, and you all shared your name back, I'd like to do that again. But I want to do it differently. Now, I want to know what name God calls you. I want to know what he has impressed in you this morning. I'd like to meet you. So if your name is free, if you've been set free, stand so I can meet you. If you are worthy, if your name is worthy, stand. If your name is chosen, stand. If your name is forgiven, stand. If your name is Masterpiece, stand. If you are a child of God, stand. If you are greatly loved, stand. Stand. That is your name. That is your name. That is who you are. That is who you are. That is who we are. Father God, I thank you so much for allowing us to be able to hear your word this morning. Father, I pray that you just instill that word into us. For when we leave this place here and that the world or ourselves or our mirror tries to go back to the other name, that we hear your voice, that we hear your love and you say, no, remember, I named you worthy. I named you free. I named you child of God. That is your name. And Father, for some of us, we come in here, we don't even know. We don't even know that we have a relationship with you. We've never really taken that opportunity to ask you into our lives. And today, we don't want to miss that opportunity. So maybe some of us, our name's going to be I'm a brand new child of God. So this morning, I would like to lead in, in a simple prayer. Simple but powerful prayer for those that want to ask Jesus into their lives to take the first 
position into their lives for the first time. And we're going to do this as a community together because that's by his design. So we are all going to be saying this. So repeat after me and say, Jesus, you are first in my life. I am no longer the label that I put or that the world puts. I am a child of God. And I ask you into my life from this day forward. Amen.